Namaste, good evening, and welcome to Chitta Media. I'm your host, Sharan Sethi. You're watching another edition of Vaishali Dialogues. Now, we introduced this format of panel discussions to come out with a range of discussions on topics ranging from political uh, affairs to strategic affairs and what's happening around the world. Joining today are two very eminent guests who are going to be asking and answering questions pertaining to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the developments in Kashmir. Why is there a rise of radical Barelvi Islam in Pakistan? What was the Delhi Declaration about? And was the Troika Plus meeting a reaction to the Delhi Declaration? Why is there a growing rivalry between the Pashtuns and Punjabis? What is the future of Pakistan's economic option and, sust uh, and sustenance are the key questions that I'm going to be asking my guests. Vijay Gauravari and Doc Dr. Shalini Chawla, thank you so much for joining me today. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting. Thank First you. of all, before I get into the details of the discussion, um, you know, Major Gauravari, would you like to summarize what is happening in Pakistan, especially uh, since the time the Taliban took over in Afghanistan? Because it clearly seems to have some sort of a repercussion on the uh, internal dynamics in Pakistan. Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And I think currently Pakistan has uh, far bigger problems than the Taliban. What seemed like a problem for Pakistan uh, two, three months back, you know, the Pakistani prime minister going everywhere and say, recognize the Taliban, saying that give Taliban money, give them funding, right. et cetera. Now, if you see for the past two, three weeks, uh, Imran Khan has toned down the rhetoric. Especially after 20th of November, he has toned down the rhetoric. It's not that he is not mentioning Afghanistan. That's not true. He is, but he has toned it down. Right. He has, he has toned down the rhetoric on Kashmir. And uh, a man, see, there are, first of all, a uh, lot of internal problems. Uh, first of all, I think it's, it's, if not a divorce, at least a separation with the Pakistan army, right. uh, which, which predates this entire Faiz Hamid and Najum, uh, Naji, uh, Nadeem Anjum episode, you know, that uh, ISI chief and right. the core commander thing episode. It, it predates that, but uh, I think uh, one of the things that I got to know after talking to a lot of people in Pakistan, especially students, is the fact that... Uh, uh, because of Imran Khan's government's performance, a lot of people have started blaming the people who got Imran Khan to power. Right. Tainted by association is what one professor of a university told me. Tainted by association. So basically, right. uh, everybody understands that Imran Khan uh, was was you know installed on the prime minister's chair. Uh, by the ISI or by the Pakistani army by extension. And today, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people have started blaming the Pakistan army for getting Imran Khan to power. It's not just about the price rise, though that is a very, very major factor. It's, but that is not only it. Uh, the, loss of, the loss of Pakistan's diplomatic credibility, which wasn't so much to begin with, you know, it, it wasn't very much to begin with, but... Uh, Pakistan's economic uh, standing in the world, Pakistan's constant dependence on loans and on aid. Now, this is one part of the scenario which is hurting Pakistan today very badly. Exports are down, right? Debt to GDP ratio is about 87% and counting. Uh, total loans are upward of 50 trillion Pakistani rupees. So this is not even a halfway healthy economy. This is an economy in the ICU. That right. is number one. Apart from that, a lot of opposition parties, uh, right? the pro-democracy movement, the PDM, that chapter is raising its head again, especially Maulana Fazlur Rahman. Right. Yesterday, I heard that, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the deal with, uh, the deal with Tariq Labek yeah. seems to be coming, coming apart again. Seems to be coming apart. It's, it's still holding for now, but it seems to be coming apart. That is what the initial indicators are. Right. Now, what you, what you asked uh, about, uh, you know, this Taliban thing and entire thing. Frankly speaking, it's not been much in the news. Uh, people have understood that there are ways and means of getting aid to Afghanistan 
without involving Pakistan. That was Pakistan's that was Pakistan's hook all along, right? Right, and that is exactly I, I what is happening. I was genuinely surprised, uh, uh, sir, because Pak, I, I think Imran Khan issued a statement just a couple of days back that if India wants to provide any aid to uh, Afghanistan, we wouldn't have any objection to it. See, uh, we tried to send fifty uh, fifty uh, thousand tons of wheat or something like that, right? Which they held up for more than one and a half months. Yeah. Right. So why pass why pass statements? If you're really genuine about it, let it pass through. End of story. It should be a bureaucratic matter, not a matter for a prime minister. We have not had India's prime minister commenting on it. So okay. you see, Pakistan is now slowly and slowly losing. I'm I'm not saying Pakistan. Uh, wrong for me to say Pakistan is losing interest, but somewhere I feel that the Pakistan Tehri Ke Insaf is losing interest because okay. there is no hook now. Now, as far as the generals are concerned. Of course, they are obsessed with Afghanistan, and for the next hundred years, if Pakistan survives, they will continue to be obsessed. Nice. So, a Pakistan Tehri Ke Insaf is one animal, and the Pakistani establishment is another animal. Uh, one animal will be perpetually obsessed with Afghanistan and will do everything it can to keep India out of Afghanistan, and the other animal, the Pakistan Tehri Ke Insaf, is now fighting for its own survival. And suddenly, Kashmir and Afghanistan and Palestine don't seem so romantic after all. Now, now. You see, it's it's now a real politic. So they they they're mm-hmm. sort of measuring their steps now. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shalini. If I may ask uh, ask you a question on the same lines. Now, we, we've uh, Imran Khan was supposed to be a favorite for the Pakistan Army, and after a very long time, they seem to have figured out somebody who's very compatible with the requirements of the ISI and the Pakistan Army. But even that seems to be going wrong with with with, with the turbulences that we see today. So, in that sense, uh, you know, will there be uh, ever will there ever be stability as far as uh, these dynamics are concerned in Pakistan? Um, so, thank you, Sharon, for inviting me and having me here again. It's always a pleasure. Uh, talking about the internal dynamics of Pakistan, I think there is a very, very um, classic cycle in Pakistan that we, we have seen for years and years. A democratic government comes into power, a confident leader comes into power with the support of the military and the ISI. But the, you know, the expiry date of the romance between the army and the civilian leadership doesn't is not it's very short term typically it's very short term now in these kind of situations typically if military has a choice another political choice uh, they try to have this change at the leadership and the uh, you know the 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 other civilian leadership is targeted he's typically behind bars on the charges of corruption so that that's been happening and we we see, see again after 3 years the trust deficit the widening gap and imran khan clearly what major arya said that about that you know his his assertion on and you know wanting to keep uh, faz hamid and you know not giving the official approval to the new si said chief he he clearly uh, crossed those well-established red lines, not the written red lines, but the red, uh, uh, you know, established red line. So there is this major trust deficit that has developed between the military and the civilian leadership. Now to balance that, obviously, what I feel is that there might not be a sudden change or a transition or a termination of his tenure because of multiple reasons. Having a election right now doesn't you know, fall well with the Pakistani situation because they need the strategic and the international economic support right now to hold the country. So it will not go well right now. And they don't clearly have a choice because the other two choices, potential choices, Bilawal Bhutto doesn't have a foothold in Punjab and uh, Sheba Sharif doesn't is not popular. So clearly there are no choices with the army, frankly speaking. So I think there will be this stressful relationship will continue between these uh, these two uh, bodies that we see, the civilian leadership and the the military. So this is going to be continuing on various issues of governance. These issues are there, but the highlight has been on the ISI chief where the military wanted the new chief because of some reasons were technical, but also, uh, you know, there was this close proximity of the um, of Faz Hamid, which which was there with uh, uh, with Imran Khan, I think there were other issues as well. Uh, so yeah, the, there is a trust deficit, and that trust deficit will reflect on rising challenges for Imran Khan. We will see that how 
uh, how he will finish his tenure, how he will struggle to finish the tenure, and he will be kept on pins and needles is my assessment. Uh, right. So he will he will be controlled. That control will be exercised by the military in various forms. Maybe it's you know giving more power to the extremist organizations, like we saw the deal with. Uh, you know, Terry Kilabak was actually negotiated right. with the help of the military and the clerics. Right. Uh, so we will see that that is one of the factors that we see in Pakistan, that strengthening of the extremist factions uh, is used to control the civilian leadership, right. to balance yeah. that. And other part is, you know, where I was just listening to this conversation with you, the point that you raised about the impact of Afghanistan, what has happened. So that has been one of the impact there that the strengthening of the extremist groups that we have seen, like what we saw with Terry Kilabak and also TTP, uh, how they have been raising the demands and how Pakistan military has been trying to pacify them, uh, asking them to lay down their arms. So we, there, is, there, is, there is this strong wave of extremism holding ground in Pakistan that we are seeing now as an impact of Taliban coming into power in Afghanistan. I'm, I'm really glad that you bring this up, uh, Major Gaurav Arya. There's a lot of internal developments as far as, uh, you know, uh, whether it's the rise of uh, Barilvi Islam with uh, the TLP being, uh, uh, you know, introduced into the mainstream. There's a secessionist movement in Balochistan. And now uh, it's said that the Pashtuns actually don't get along very well because they're very protective of their primacy. So, in fact, uh, they are very, uh, you know, they pose a great challenge to the Punjabis because they seem to be the dominant uh, community in Pakistan. Uh, so how do you see these ideologies interact at the moment? See, uh, there are two, three things. Here. It's, it's uh, slightly in the gray. It's not, it's not that black and white. Uh, essentially, uh, Bareilles form a majority and Devbandis do not. Right. So, uh, so uh, Terry Kalabak is essentially a Bareilles organization. And uh, Rizvi Saab, the elder, and Saad Rizvi is Rizvi Saab, the younger. Uh, who, who was in jail and just let off. I mean, he was basically in the governor's guest house, not in jail, but they chose to call it jail anyway. So this is a hardcore Barelvi organization. And for your information, the Taliban is a Devbandi organization. Right. Right. Yes. So in Afghanistan, the Taliban is a Devbandi organization. In Lahore, the Labaik is a Barelvi organization. And both these organizations' headquarters are actually in Uttar Pradesh in India. Okay. Right. So in, in, in Bareilly and Devbandi respectively. Now, Coming to the point, I, you see, uh, I, I, I think that uh, you spoke about uh, you spoke about Balochistan. If you look at the broader picture, wherever there is a secessionist movement, it requires help from a neighboring country. The reason why there are two three reasons why why uh, the Baloch movement has seen its ups and downs and has not gone to the logical conclusion that is an independent Balochistan. Right. The, re the reason is that, number one, you don't have any country which is neighboring, which is supporting it. It's very important. That is how, that is how for a decade plus, Pakistan ran it in Punjab. And that is how for 30 years plus, Pakistan is running it in Kashmir. A terrorist movement, which is also a secessionist movement, because that is what they want. The terrorists want, not the common people, but the terrorists. Now, Another point is that in Balochistan, 60 to 65 percent of the population is non-Baloch. Right. Balochistan is Pashtun majority. Okay. And the third point that you mentioned, uh, achha, sorry, second point, mein ek aur baat hai na, ki Balochistan is also in Iran. Yeah. It's, it's not just in uh, right. Pakistan. Part of Balochistan, a significant part of Balochistan is also in Iran. So uh, that is what borders, largely borders right. uh, Pakistan also. And uh, so essentially what is happening here in Pakistan is that uh, when we speak about the Pashtun, whether we talk about the Pashtun Tahafuz movement, which is a largely left-leaning, if I may dare use the word secular, okay, right. not, in the not in the classical sense, but yes, yeah, yeah. that is what they claim to be. And of course, the natural inheritors of the Khudai Kidnatkars of frontier Gandhi Khan, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, because that was, see, this is also a contradiction in terms. Pashtuns are not known to be peaceful. Afghanistan or great, greater Afghanistan is known as the graveyard of empires, right? And Pashtuns don't fill anybody's tick box mm -hmm. of being a peaceful people, but the, the Pashtun Tahafuz movement. Now, there are two MNAs who owe loyalty to the Pashtun Tahafuz movement. Both were arrested. Uh, 
Mohsen Dawar is out. Ali Wazir is still in prison, yeah, somewhere in some ISI hellhole. And both are MNAs. Both are member of Parliament, Pakistan National Assembly members. Right. So what is ha- what is happening is that I do not think Baloch separatism is troubling Pakistan so much. Right. It, it, it is not. I think I think what is actually, and this is my own analysis. I could be wrong, but my analysis is that what is actually you know, a very major and a potent force which can unsettle Pakistan is Pashtun nationalism or Pashtun sub-nationalism. Right. And, there are, and there are three, four reasons for it. Number one, uh, even the Taliban, which was supposed to be a friendly regime, today will not say that they recognize the Durand line. Correct. Yeah. That, that is number one. They do not. And they have said it as much. And they never admitted it. So, uh, uh, they claim the area up to Margala Hills. Margala Hills is from where you can look down on Islamabad, right? So right. these are Margala Hills in each Islamabad. Yeah. So they claim the area up to Margala Hills, by the way. That is point number one. Point number two is that uh, the largest and the most powerful community after the Punjabis who find sizable representation in the Pakistani armed forces and the bureaucracy are the Pashtuns. Right. Though it, though it was the Muhajirs that... Uh, you know, initially framed everything in Pakistan because they were the people, the Muslims who went from UP, from Bihar, from Delhi, from Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan. These were the Urdu speaking people who actually, you know, gave them their munshis and their clerks and their bureaucrats and the frame of their bureaucracy was essentially Mahajir and later on other people caught up, the Punjabis caught up. Uh, That's a separate uh, issue altogether. So this is another thing, the Pashtuns. That is why Pashtuns. And thirdly, the biggest collection of Pashtuns is neither in Quetta, which is the capital of Balochistan, or yes. in uh, Peshawar, which is Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. The largest collections of Pashtun in Pakistan is inside Karachi. Uh, and Karachi is 60 to 65% of Pakistan's GDP. Uh, the Pakistan army is cognizant of this danger. Right. And this is where it stands today. Interesting, uh, but you know uh, what? Ha- what uh, what we also need to take cognizance of is that um, is the amount of control that uh, the ISI and Pakistan Army has over the Taliban, right? Because it's said in popular na- knowledge that uh, three out of the six factions are somehow under the Pakistani influence, and uh, of course they're trying to actively control the entire network with with the help with the help of the Haqqanis. Uh, so, do you see any changes uh, in this as you know, uh, since ever since the Taliban took over? Uh, I have, I have a different, uh, I have a different, uh, uh, you know, uh, idea about this, uh, Sharan. And my idea is that uh, it's not that black and white. Okay. Loyalty, loyalties in Afghanistan are, you know, sold and purchased all the time. Right. It's it's a tribal network. It's a highly tribal society that owes allegiance to the family and the tribe and the sub-tribe. This concept of an Afghan nation, as we understand it in modern terms of a nation state, is not there. Even then we speak about Pashtun sub-nationalism, that's a different concept. Right. Now the thing is that you see whether it is the uh, Haqqanis on one side, the Mahsuds on another side, and this being under Pakistani control, everybody needs money and now people have realized Earlier, they thought that while Pakistan does not have money, they can get money from China. They can get money. Pakistan has been blackmailing the world. Now they realize after 15th of August that neither can Pakistan get money, nor can Pakistan give money. Pakistan oversold. They did the same thing that you are saying. You know, Pakistan exactly did the same thing that you're asking. They sold this control over the Taliban to the Chinese. Right. And they said, you can take CPAC from here. You get the CPAC through Afghanistan into Iran, or you get the CPAC from here and all that. This thing, you know, ideally it would have come through the Wakhan corridor. It's it's lower than the Karakoram. Karakorams are very high. The Wakhan corridor is much lower and much much more sen- much more sensible and much more strategically important also. So all these things Pakistan was trying to do. In the end, as it stands today, after August, right? More than three months have passed. This is the fourth month. The thing is that. Uh, uh, Pakistan has been unable to get money or recognition for the Afghan Taliban and the people who are loyal. These are mercenaries, essentially. Let me be very honest. These are mercenaries. They owe loyalty for a certain period of time. You know, many people say that, oh, this leader of that terror outfit, you know, 
he was raised in pakistan it doesn't matter it doesn't matter who was raised where in the end everybody has you see there is something in 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 the quranic uh, this thing called male ganimat male ganimat is essentially spoils of war right so what are the spoils of war they go to the state bank of afghanistan they ask the head of the bank for money and all the poor guy has is something like 18 20000 yes. and they thought that there, there were millions upon billions upon uh, those dollars in the safe and he says no today everything is wire transfer you know they, they, we don't have any cash ye yeah. aapko 18 18 20000 dollars ye aap le jao they threatened they beat up the staff they said boss you can kill us but there is no money and that money is still in uh, this thing held up somewhere so the, you see yeah. this entire thing about you know pakistan controlling afghan taliban yes that part is true but it is not uh, it is not that kind of hold that we think it is Right. it is it, it is a tenuous hold it is coming apart slowly and slowly as weeks pass as hunger grows as dissatisfaction grows as the people who fought so there are two kinds of taliban i i am sorry uh, i would like to apologize to uh, you know uh, dr shalini ma'am taking up too much of your time J- just like to uh, un- underscore a certain point ek chota mm-hmm. sa point bata do ye do taliban hai theek hai there are two talibans one taliban is the one who fought for 20 years against the us led forces and the americans and the other taliban were the ones who were in doha drinking orange juice in five star hotels okay so yeah. the, so there is there is the orange juice taliban and there is the fighting taliban and the orange juice taliban already made their money they've yeah. already seen the world now the fighting taliban says where is the male ganimat where are the spoils of war right where is the silver right so you had a lot of weapons you had caches of uh black hawk helicopters etc that is all fine but where are the dollars there are no dollars right so that is the problem thank you so much uh, for your observation sir uh, dr shalini how does economics play a role in uh, the developments that we have been seeing whether it's in afghanistan or pakistan because clearly the pakistanis seem to be over dependent on the chinese and it perhaps is not going so well because of the uh, realities of uh, uh, today so yeah the economic desperation we see in pakistan and you know if you read the numbers it is quite alarming where they are standing 8.9% inflation they require close to 50.2 billion dollars to meet their requirements in the next two years and about i think uh, 70% i mean and then the uh, liability standard the standard around rupees 50 trillion or something Right. and about 70% of these liabilities are have been you know um, uh, increased in during imran khan's tenure so there are deeper issues in the econ- econo- economic economies economy and they are desperately they have negotiated an agreement with the imf a staff member agreement has been negotiated but they do need the money now saudi arabia has offered them the money but that's the kind of money the terms and conditions which come with it that whenever saudis want the money back in 72 hours notice they will have to give so it's like a ba- money in the bank there but obviously they can't use it right. now the chinese did provide some relief last year we saw that they bailed out and gave them the money to get out you know get rid of the of the saudi debt but we don't i don't think the chinese are going to be bailing out repeatedly so ultimately it will be an increasing reliance for pakistan on the united states that's that's very very clear to even even uh, pakistan that whatever they might say Uh, they might keep rejoicing their victory and strategic depth in afghanistan they managed to attain but at the end of the day they need to put their own house in order and that vulnerability at the international level they they definitely feel and you us on the other side is we don't have too much clarity on how they're going to be dealing with pakistan because i think there is rethinking and reevaluation and you know looking back into those 20 years what did pakistan i mean they need pakistan for sure Uh, for you know because they for their counter terror efforts so they would also like to have some kind of support system being extended but pakistan's reliance and its effort to build up its uh, political and economic relationship with the united states will be there but it also realizes that there is a growing partnership of us and india and so it needs to look for options so chinese they can't definitely uh you know that's an indispensable alliance i feel for both of them there are issues in the 
in the whole uh, relationship there are challenges like we are seeing there are protests going on in Gwadar right now um, over multiple issues the fishing licenses have been given to the Chinese there is energy crisis there is drinking water disappearance but all these issues which we see and also there is a lot of debate that the rise in Pakistan's liability um, a significant chunk is due to the CPEC that discussion is also on although Pakistan keeps denying it so there are these challenges in, in, in Pakistan China relationship with we, we see but the bigger question, I think, which we need to ask when we are evaluating it, that are these challenging challenges significant enough to change the course of that alliance, which impacts India? So I don't think that's going to happen. Right. So that will go on. So Chinese will extend the help to your question about the economy to an extent. Uh, but I don't see Chinese giving a complete bailout. So they, they will rely on multiple factors for that. But also I have seen as a scholar in Pakistan studying it for now more than two decades. You know, I think they have just got used to living in crisis. Right. This crisis has just settled in that system. Whenever they have an economic crisis, there is a lot of, you know, noise around talking to IMF, talking to various actors, they manage the bailout. They manage the bailout, it gives them a breather, and then egg, do, teen, sal, khub, ash, karte. Then again, back there, they are into the same cycle. Typically, the next cycle, when it comes, it's a new government, so it's their headache. So that's, that has been the cycle which Pakistan has just got very well settled into and there has been no and now i think with the numbers that we see i don't even i mean how will that whole reversal happen it completely looks impossible uh, but then if the second question that one feels that will this lead to the failure of a state i think that's not going to happen so it will remain okay. like an ailing state but right. not a failed state because of the economy, not as if now I don't see it happening. So. But there is always a point of saturation when it, it will all explode, right? So is that going to happen soon? Because it cannot be perpetually an ailing state. No, I, that's what I said, that it will not, because ultimately also you have to take keep in your mind that it's a nuclear weapon state. Right. So explosion of a nuclear weapon state with the terrorist organizations, their sectarian issues, their Taliban government on the border, right. uh, you know, there is an international community which will think about it. And there is a lot of debate in United States when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, multiple testimonies which were, uh, you know, there and uh, um, uh, discussions in the Senate were also about the fact that it's a nuclear weapon state and who's going to be responsible for that and how, how does one look at the security of that arsenal. So that nuclear weapons definitely what Pakistan always has, you know, in their mind that they will ultimately guard their sovereignty. Uh, it, it is something which will come to their rescue in terms of not allowing the state to collapse. Right. Thank you so much for your observations, ma'am. Points very well noted. Major, um, uh, Major sir, you know, if I may ask you this, uh, India, ever since probably uh, a decade or so, has successfully, to a certain extent, managed to isolate Pakistan on the international stage. Now, clearly, they are, they are completely reliant on the Chinese and a few other allies for help uh, on the international level. But as far as India's policy to Pakistan, uh, towards Pakistan is concerned, what changes do you see, especially because uh, the NSA uh, had the Delhi Declaration and then uh, simultaneously the Pakistan, uh, Pakistanis came up with the Troika Plus meeting? See, uh, Pakistan has been isolating itself for a very long time, even without India's uh, Najan push. Right. They, they have overplayed the strategic uh, you know, the geostrategic location part, they have overplayed it. In the geostrategic location part, they uh, they have a have an advantage because Iran has boxed itself into a corner. And it is mostly emotional talk, rhetoric that comes out of Tehran and even out of Washington. See, what happens is, uh, why is Pakistan important? Because Pakistan has a border with Afghanistan. Pakistan provides a route into Central Asia. Pakistan has a seaport. Two, three things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Forget about nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons have nothing to do with access. Right? Right. The issue is that Iran provides exactly the same thing and Iran is far more stable than Pakistan. Right. It might be under sanctions, but it's stable. Now, let us assume a scenario where this emotional things about, you know, death to the Jews and we'll bomb Iran and the Israelis saying we'll bomb... Uh, 
this thing and this Hezbollah. If you take it out of the equation, and that is what India has been doing, uh, engaging with Iran constantly, trying to make a bridge, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is that once you have Iran on the center stage, once you have this whole thing about Iran being a pariah state out of the way, Pakistan automatically gets isolated. That is number two. Number three, the Delhi Declaration. No? Essentially, uh, China chose not to attend. Pakistan chose not to attend, which is, which is all right. Which is all right. This is essentially New Delhi saying that we still have stakes in Afghanistan. It's not about the three plus billion dollars that we spent. We have a tremendous amount of goodwill. We have a tremendous amount of goodwill in Afghanistan. And we have a tremendous amount of goodwill to all the stans, you know. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, mm -hmm. Tajikistan, all these stans and all that. We, and all of them attended the Delhi Dialogue. So we have a tremendous amount of goodwill. And Russia, by extension, uh, by, by the fact that they were essentially part of USSR before 1990, Russia also has a tremendous amount of goodwill there. Russia conducts military exercises and, you know, so many factories, Russian factories, uh, weapons manufacturing, Kalishnikov factories. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of this thing. Finally, coming to the fact about this, this thing, you know, this Troika Plus and all that. See, Troika Plus is essentially a Chinese brainchild. Chinese didn't want to come in front because Chinese want a convenient scapegoat. If it fails, okay. you blame Pakistan. Uh, an American journalist once said, and I don't think it was, uh, it was in very good taste, but he said that uh, China has two mad dogs, North Korea and Pakistan. You know, okay. so they leave people uh, some Americans said it. So uh, this is what it is. This entire Delhi dialogue and Troika Plus is not about uh, is not about Pakistan and India. It is China on one side, and India on the other side, and then there is Russia, and then there is the United States of America. Right. The rest of the people also play a role, but majorly these three four countries are in the fray. Pakistan because it has a because it has a border. Right. And Iran, because Iran was also there. So Iran, because it has a border. And that is what it pretty much is. So, and, uh, you know, this may seem a, um, a little bit off the topic, but what does all of these, what do all of these developments mean for Kashmir and uh, the stability in Kashmir? I, I don't think, I don't think it will impact Kashmir so very much, though, as the crow flies, Kashmir is not very far away from Afghanistan. If you look at the map, no, uh, it's not very far from there. Uh, I think it's less than 200 kilometers or 150 kilometers, just... Uh, Gilgit, Baltistan and parts of POK or something like that. If I'm not mistaken, I, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm quoting some other data. I don't remember correctly. But uh, fact of the matter is Afghanistan is not very far. And that part, we claim that part to be ours. Right. POK and Gilgit, Baltistan, what the Pakistanis called Azad Kashmir, that is essentially our area. Now, I don't, there were, there were mumbles earlier in Kashmir among the terror outfits, get Taliban Aega, Taliban Aega, Azadi Milegi, and also you know, somebody on Pakistan television, that lady from the Pakistan Tehri Kensaf also said it. And uh, to Imran Khan's credit, he actually, that, that lady spokesperson was actually told to like uh, stay away from prime time television. Because see, Afghanistan in the end, even Taliban, we tend to think of them as uh, medieval Islamists, which they are. Right. That part is not wrong. But even medieval Islamists, know the value of the dollar. Right. right. They know the value of the dollar. They need investment in Afghanistan. They need money. And there aren't very many people. Who, who are the people with the track record of spending in Afghanistan? China Paisa Dega is... Okay, China Paisa Dega. I'm not saying no. Of course, China may give money in the future. But who has given money? Who has a track record? It is basically... The Americans. The Americans and the Indians. Right. Mostly the Americans. There are other people also, but Americans and the Indians. Yes. Right. So do you actually see the Taliban being legitimized at some point and investments coming in? I hope not. <laughs> I, I can't say and never say never in this world. I've learned this. Never say never. You don't know. Kal ho jai, announcement ho jai, but uh, I hope not because uh, essentially right. we must understand. Uh, you see, a lot is being made. People don't understand. The same set of people have functioned uh, and fought under the flag of the Al-Qaeda. Right. And the Islamic State Khorasan chapter. Yeah, yeah. And the Afghan Taliban and the Tehrik Taliban Pakistan. Right. Th this, is, this is like the Silicon Valley of terrorists, okay? Yeah. So, uh, so they, they, they keep on going from here to here to here to here to here. And uh, 
essentially all of them even in even in uh, even in uh, uh, in in uh, al qaeda which is essentially an arabic construct even in al qaeda uh, more, more than 50% of the the terrorists of al qaeda in afghanistan are actually ethnic pashtuns right so so there are 8 to 12000 foreign fighters also in afghanistan so there are iraqis there are chinese there are sudanese there are palestinians there are x y z jo bhi hain the entire gamut of them but they maintain that pashtun thread all these four terror organizations have that common pashtun thread right so uh, thank you so much for that uh, dr shalini you know what does this mean for the future of pri and the uh, cpec projects uh, in some of these areas and uh, in uh, the pok and pakistan and even for that matter afghanistan so Shalini, because, uh, as much uh, as much supportive uh, as the chinese could be in uh, letter but i but, but i don't think but i think even they are sort of reevaluating whether they need to uh, make these investments uh, because of the natural threats uh, that these regions uh, pose okay thank you sharan is it okay with you if i just want to add something on kashmir yeah please go ahead uh, said so on kashmir i what i feel is that you know the impact is we are starting to see it and we will see it i mean or obviously we are extreme our security forces are doing a phenomenal job but one is definitely the ideological victory part you know which the all the these organizations feel ideologically much more empowered so that sense is definitely there and also i think pakistan if you watch the their decisions for example the new us envoy from pakistan saad masood has been you know appointed right. he is known for a very very you know a guy who has been connected with the radical elements and he has known to be pursuing the kashmir agenda of kashmir very aggressively in the past so definitely i what i feel is although major arya is right that you know currently pakistan is kind of lying low on that but uh, certainly in the, in the coming time in the coming months i think there they will be very very aggressively trying to internationalize the kashmir mission they will they will go ahead with that so that will go ahead and we should not forget major general bajwa's uh, you know statement where he said that you know pakistan will win the fifth generation war or the hybrid war so what what is he name so that narrative in pakistan will definitely be kept alive because that narrative and the kashmir narrative keeps the military alive so that that will not i don't see it lying low and i see that intensifying in the future your question about the bri and cpc Uh, you are right sharan because the bri came with tremendous you know the, uh, as if it's going to be changing the whole yeah. whole face of pakistan it was called the game game changer and the way it was sold to the pakistanis but then there are there are multiple challenges which are happening uh, 60 billion dollars have been talked about but definitely that that they are they are coming in a much more scattered form there are challenges we are seeing lot of protests in baluchistan there are technical issues in the in particular deals number of major deals have uh, are stand stagnated uh, but to your question as will what will chinese do they will not pull out at this stage what they can do is they are going to be putting more pressure on pakistan the security aspect yes there are two incidents which happened in the past targeting the chinese uh, official and the uh, you know workers diplomats uh, for which chinese have been putting pressure on pakistan but they very clearly see pakistan and also very importantly now afghanistan as a connector to the world through bri right so definitely they are not going to pull back or anything but i think they have a lot of pressure point on pakistan they have this leverage on pakistan because of the money that they have invested to right. be able to twist that arm and apply pressure on pakistan so there will be stress there will be stresses strains and cpc has its own uh, repercussions which we will see which are already seeing in the form of protests and other variations we will see in future but it will still i think just stressfully it will just move on as i said that they have just learned to live with the crisis so i i think it with uh, chinese will have this leverage on pakistan with this investment and they very clearly have this connectivity uh, you know on their agenda 
uh, in this whole region which they want to pursue. As we all know, and even in Afghanistan, we have these multiple Chinese engineers and others are already there evaluating the minerals and other things. So Chinese have been very focused, so they would want to take it forward. Uh, but the challenges will be definitely there. It's not going what to. What you're saying is that uh, the pattern of economic enslavement of certain nations will continue, even if it is Pakistan for that matter. Yes, it will continue. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, Major Gauravarya will uh, conclude uh, with one final question because running, we are running short in time. You know, how do we address the problem at home? Because many of these ideologies, like we were discussing earlier, uh, whether it's the Diobandi or the Barelvi, emanate from India in Uttar Pradesh. So, uh, and of course, since India has such a big Muslim population, we also need to be uh, sensitive about how this needs to be handled. So in that sense, what uh, do you think India's policy should be and how can we approach this uh, sensitive subject going forward? You know, the truthful answer is I don't know. Uh, and that is the truth. Uh, I don't know because this is so complex for me to answer in a few minutes. It's so wide and so complex. And I don't think I have enough research or I've read enough to back my answer with, with data and with fact. And uh, currently what I know is conjecture, but I think, yes, uh, what can be done is, you know, uh, more uh, interaction between communities in India. It is what you think of as a strength. Uh, there was a time when I met so many people from the government of India and, uh, you know, long, long back, uh, I, I was in school and uh, they would come home and whenever there was a discussion on geopolitics, they would always say that, you know, Pakistan's real power is that it's a Muslim country and, uh, you know, everybody thinks alike. Apparently not so. Right. Apparently not so. And in between 2006 and uh, 2016, in these 10 years, only in Karachi, more than 25,000 people were killed. And 99.9% .9 of those who were killed were Muslim. So, uh, yeah. So it's, it's not like it's Islam is a homogeneous entity. It's not. Uh, their, their way of praying and the methodology of practicing the religion will be the same. But there are so many fakes, so many uh, uh, types of understanding of the faith, so many uh, different, you know, there are Dibandi, Barelvi. In Shias, there are Seveners, there are Twelvers, you know, uh, and uh, it just goes on and on and on and on. There are many uh, Muslims. So uh, apart from Shia, Sunni, etc. So th there's a lot of difference also there. In India, I think... Uh, I, I think we need to stick to the straight and narrow and, uh, you know, have a lot of interaction between communities, have a lot of, uh, have a lot of uh, communication between communities because isolation is not going to help. You have, you have, and it should not help. It should not help. You have, you have crores and crores of Muslims in India. Yeah. And they are Indians, right? Of yeah. course, there are bad fish everywhere. Yeah. It's not just in Muslims. There are bad fish everywhere in all religions. There are bad fish. But the fact of the matter is that radical Islam is also a reality. Yeah. You cannot ignore it. So you have to walk a tightrope. You have to figure out a response in between. And uh, and honestly speaking, I, I do not have that much uh, academic research with me to right. suggest alternatives. But uh, you know, but this is this is what I think. This is what I think. And uh, what is happening in Kashmir, especially with the uh, minorities being targeted? Uh, do you think that's the uh, that's the reaction of a few last men standing? Yeah, but it's it it shows desperation. It shows uh, you see they get money these terror outfits. They get money because you know they have to show something to Pakistan. So uh, actually, this entire Azadi nonsense which was happening in Kashmir now. The backbone has been broken after abrogation of 317 I, I go to Kashmir. In the last three months, I've gone to Kashmir four times. Yeah. Right. So that is my frequency of travels and to Kashmir. And I'm not talking about... Changes do you see, sir, in the last few lot years? Of, a lot of changes. This time, uh, there are traffic jams in Kashmir because there are so many tourists. Yeah. Right. So there are, tra there are traffic jams. And if you ever approach Srinagar airport, if you have to take a flight from Srinagar to any part of the world, you normally, we say, you know, reach the airport one hour before. In Srinagar, reach the airport three hours before because right. there'll be two kilometer two kilometer uh, line of taxis there. So, so whether it's Pahalgam, whether it's Gulmar, whether it's Srinagar, whether it's Anantanag uh, ahead, uh, whether it's Pulwama, this entire uh, you know saffron belt, there are so many tourists that it's it's difficult to just think. They're right. all the, from all over the country. But the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, terrorism is there in Kashmir, and they are specifically targeting people of the Hindu and Sikh community. 
because that is what pakistan wants is being done on pakistan's directions to sustain a certain kind of narrative not create sustain a certain kind of narrative right. and this is the narrative that we are fighting against in kashmir thank you so much uh, major gauravari and dr shalini chawla for joining us today uh, i hope it was a productive uh, discussion and uh, viewers please do let us know what you thought about this in the comment section below namaste and i hope uh, we can have more such conversations in the future Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanyawad. Namaskar.